Welcome back to another episode of the EXP podcast. I'm joined once again by Kem and Luan, my co-hosts, and we've got with us two fantastic guests to discuss the topic of stylized art with us this week. We have Jasmine and Tobias. So Jasmine, can you introduce yourself for us? Yes. Hey, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm Jasmine Habazai Fikri. I'm a 3D environment artist. Currently, I'm still finishing university. And in the past, I have been interning at Square Enix and worked on several games as a freelancer. And Tobias. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Tobias Tapp, and I'm currently also a 3D environment artist in Montreal working at Epic Games. So this week we're going to be discussing um, stylized art and we're going to be talking about kind of defining stylized art. So it's a pretty broad topic, but both of you have got some amazing stylized work out there and we're hoping you can help us kind of break down and, and discuss around the topic. Uh, so to start us off, how about we, we look at how would you define stylized art and um, yeah, let's start there. How would you define kind of stylized art in general? Uh, Tobias, do you want to start us off? Um, sure. I feel I, I feel like it's a very difficult question because in a way, for games at least, I feel like everything is kind of stylized. Even even like realistic art, you need to put it in a certain style. Like it always serves a purpose. But um, for more like the traditional stylized art, I would say anything that is either like hand painted, exaggerated shapes, or like something out of the ordinary that isn't too closely based on realism. Okay, and Jasmine, do you agree with that? Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think I personally try to like understand from the start what it really means, like stylized. And I think it's really good to explain with fine art even, because something that resembles in some way the physical world, but still is different. An example for that would be like realistic sculptures of, of poets or like in the past from in Greek times they're very realistic but compared to a very abstract sculpture you would see in a park that's very stylized and I think what we do in games is more something that's significantly stylized it's not very extremely stylized because we still have things that resemble what we see in everyday life but there's to be a set exaggerated in shapes and colors and the amount of detail we have in the models and the objects we have so even realism in a way is stylized because we cannot replicate it one-to-one -one yet. There's still some inaccuracies there. So maybe 3D scans and Quixel are going to bring us even closer to realism. But until then, I think even realism is stylized in a way. Okay. I think Luan uh, mentioned in one of our previous uh, episodes uh, something that Tobias kind of picked up on there about how uh, everything, all games have a certain amount of stylization in them. Um, I think the example you used back then, the one was Uncharted and how it even Uncharted for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, there's a... You can see in a lot of games um, that attempt to do something more realistic, it's, like, photorealism is a style in and of itself, right? Um, it's not the kind of uh, style that you think of when you say stylized, but it is a style. So I think it's, it's kind of important to define uh, stylized things as... Uh, you know, it's uh, exaggerated shapes. It's uh, or if you're going for something a little bit more cartoony, it's kind of you know, it's got quite uh, it's very soft. It's got it's a very soft image, or it's very blocky colors and stuff like that, right? And with Uncharted, you got this kind of uh, I, I I never know quite how to describe the style, but it, things are very pulp action and that kind of defines the style like things are very saturated uh very grandiose it's not quite you know hyper it's not hyper realism but it's also no photorealism and it kind of sort of sits in this in between sort of uh stage so even like games that you think are are quite realistic are actually quite stylized in a lot of sense right but yeah that's kind of what I, what i said back then and i think uh it's quite uh important to define the style yeah, I agree. Like with Uncharted, uh, especially, I think it it uses everything. Like it's, it all comes from realism. Like the the materials, the object, and it's like all to the right scale. And but everything is like arranged very spectacularly. There's barely ever any minute where not something epic happens, and that's also I feel like part of the style and part of the art style. So, do you think the style for like especially realistic games isn't just tied to their visuals? Because obviously you just pointed out there that there's always something epic happening in that game. Like it just doesn't stop. Yeah, but I mean it's for for every game. Like most of the time, there 
is something 3D there for the purpose of the game. Like, oh, there's a big tower. It's because you probably want to go there. Like, that's very uncharted to show you, like, the landmark in the distance. And it's usually something, like, very over-the-top spectacular. You wouldn't have that in a normal town or... It's just someone put it there on purpose. So with the... With the realistic, because I'm kind of more interested in the realistic side of things actually at the moment with the stylized take you pointed out, um, like with mega scans and other things like photogrammetry and, and all these new technologies coming up, like what is the, how do you stand out from the crowd? I guess if you're working on one of those games, like if there's still stylization on these, on these projects, like what actually makes it stylized? I don't know, yes, when you want to take this. Do you mean like if how stylized games can keep up with that? How that realistic games can kind of catch more up the, with their realism or and how stylized games can do that? Sorry. More the realistic one. because um, if if every game, so if we take God of War and Last of Us mm -hmm. Two, for example, like they're both hyper realistic. Yeah. But they they still look different. And I think it's understanding those differences that a lot of people struggle with, um, without like analyzing. I think the setting has a great role in this, also the story, because God of War obviously is set in a very mythological world that isn't as close to the one we live in right now. So I would say that also adds to that feel of stylization and the whole feel of the world being a lot different to The Last of Us, which tries to bring us in the moment of that and brings us closer to our reality now. Um, that's why I think realistic games could play more onto to bring us into worlds that we would like to experience that we can't at all at the moment. That's why I really enjoy with Assassin's Creed because I'm super interested in history and playing these games in different times of history and being able to experience them so closely and almost looking the same as they did back then is, I think, a really good thing that realistic games can set themselves apart from each other to bring something new to the table without replicating what we already see in our lives already. So if we're saying that most games have some sort of stylization to them um, in some way, based on that, uh, there must be some kind of defined style that each game is trying to follow. So how do, how do they kind of get there? Or, or how have you guys kind of approached that in your own work or projects you've worked on fitting into that style um, how how did you either decide on the style for your own work or how did you kind of slot into the workflow of another game um, that already had like a predetermined style? Who wants to go ahead on that one? Uh, yeah, I can start. Um, I mean, if, if, you, if you start working on the game, usually there's already an art style defined, so you just have to kind of learn and adapt to that and then maybe also like try to with your own work and experience kind of try to push that even further with the help of the team um and then for yeah for personal work it's usually just trying over time to figure out what i have the most fun with because those are the projects that i want to do for fun and not like have anyone tell me kind of what to do and it kind of just happened to all be stylized for me are you creating your own, like, I guess, art style as you work on these personal projects? Because you and Jasmine have a very, like, you each have your own style, but they're very distinct to the point where if I see a thumbnail, I know who's who's made that. Mm. It's, I, I feel like for me, it just happened to be this way. Um, it's not really on purpose. It's just like over time. It's just, yeah. I, I, I mean, I see it too. Like, there's a certain style, but it's not really on purpose. Yeah, I agree with that. It really develops over time because stylized art is such a broad theme, but each game that you already look at as well has its own rules that are set in stone, kind of, that define each style. So there's a lot of like subcategories in it. And it's the same with my work. I started out with something because I just love to hand paint and was really inspired by World of Warcraft. But then I moved away from that and draw more inspiration from films I watched or graphic novels I read and developed more into a direction that I was interested in and wanted to emphasize on. 
And over time, you kind of de develop your own art uh, rules and art Bible in that sense, similar to when you join a project and there is a set art style. So I think you develop that by yourself in your personal projects as well over time. I actually wanted to uh, ask you about that, actually, because both of you ha kind of have a little bit of your own defined style, right? Like, so if I look at each of your art stations, like, oh, I, I know this is your work and I know that's your work. Um, what would you say um, have you drawn from, like, past inspirations and stuff that has helped you define your style? And actually, how would you describe your style? I know it's a tough question, but, like, what would you say is the sort of the thing that makes your style yours? Uh, you want to start? <laughs> I can try. <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know, I know, I know. Tough one. But... Tobias is like buying time right now. He's like, I need to oh, think. Let me write I gotta down. Think. <laughs> um, I think for me, one of the main things that I always hear people also say to me, which I agree on a lot, is that I love very vibrant colors and um, yeah. very um, uh, defining shapes and having that detailing in the right places without getting like too lost into micro detailing which I used to do a lot more I think in the past so I think that's one of the big things for me and having uh, lighting support that as well because usually hand painted stuff is reliant on just a diffuse map but over time I realized that with my lighting I can really push the pieces and push the colors that I want to put emphasis on and um, so I think having really interesting lighting with the piece together is one of my key um, stylistic choices I like to make, which I didn't see before a lot in hand-painted works, which I tried to translate into PBR then too, which was really fun. <laughs> That's what you did with the, the market entrance, right? Yeah. The, the latest project? Yeah. Okay. I tried to like draw from my uh, hand-painting experience and implement it into PBR too. But then playing Overwatch a lot in the past years too, I realized how a lot of their textures really look hand-painted already. So I felt like I can combine that well together and draw from both spheres, basically. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, I, I guess it would be good to know from uh, Tobias as well, like where, where you put inspiration from, because you've worked on a lot of big projects, Spyro, Fortnite, um, and also the, the Oasis scene that you've done is pretty uh, memorable, actually. It's, I think it's what most people know you for, actually. I remember this scene. Yeah, that, that, that scene helped a lot with getting jobs. Um, I, 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 I'm kind of the same as you, uh, because I, I also kind of started doing this whole hand-painted thing and then also realized that um, you can do so much more with like lighting and materials and... Um, I think the the reason why this style is so popular was so popular because back then it was like kind of easy on performance to do because you didn't need lighting so much. But now it's kind of a question: Hey, can we push this a bit further? Maybe doing uh, like with materials and lighting, and but then still keeping like all the artistry in there. And I think over time for me, I just um, gotten lazier <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, yeah. didn't want to <laughs> didn't want to paint so much anymore like I don't want to paint my um, like personally I, I totally love seeing hand painted stuff and everything but I don't want to paint my, my reflections anymore or like go in there and like smudge around <laughs> in my texture so I just mm. like I kind of like followed more the, the like procedure route and then with substance painter designer it just it got a lot easier to do things faster and especially for for environment art like i tend to over scope my scenes they i kind of end up i think everyone does yeah they they, they end up <laughs> always natural really big. um and so i'm just like where can i not spend so much time because i get like cool. i cannot spend so much time on one asset it drives me crazy yeah, yeah really. i can imagine yeah. I really agree on the part of getting lazy in a way too, because after my last <laughs> last project, I tried to do hand painted again, and it's really fun. But I just think, why does it take so long? And I just want to go into the substance painter and just put my maps on it, and that's it. I don't need to <laughs> sit and paint for like six hours. It's just so. it's just working smart. It's, it's not lazy. It's just being smart. Yeah. No, it's, it's lazy. It's like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I've. I've personally not done any like hand painting um, assets like you two, but like, how does it differ with with substance painter? Like, can you still not? Could you achieve the the hand painted look using substance painter, or is it just better to stick to to PBR if you're going to do that method? 
don't know i tried in the past uh, like currently as well just like some simple foliage i wanted to paint in some of the details and it just doesn't feel right to me sometimes <laughs> i don't know why maybe there's like a better way to approach it. and there are people who do hand paint and substance painter but the brushes and how they feel they just don't work as well i think if you just use a more conventional hand painting tool like photoshop or 3D code where it's just the diffuse and that's it. You don't have to worry about anything else. So, um, yeah. Yes, yeah, completely alien to me. I've never hand painted anything, and yeah, but also, I'm sure I look awful. Also, I think hand like hand painted is not a style. Just hand painted is it could be anything. Because it's the process. Yeah, yeah you yeah. can hand paint anything. Like look at oh shit, what's a good game? I don't know, but uh, like not like World of Warcraft for example. It's hand painted, but that's not the style it's just yep. what people do a lot because they do it like really really great but you can also hand paint uh there's this other big mmo and the style is totally different. difference more realistic but it's still hand painted and yeah. i think Al albion or something oh yes albion yeah yes. so totally different style but still hand painted so it's yeah. kind of it's not a style it's just like the way you it's, try it's to, the process of, yeah, the process. of making the, yeah. the style i guess it's like how stylized is like a, the big word for all these games that are included in and they don't look anything alike because they all have their yeah. own rules and guidelines they follow. Which is a shame because I feel like it's just realistic versus stylized in the general yeah. like view, but it's it's so much more granular than that. Yeah. And I think Luan is going to chime in now. Uh, yeah, no, because the, 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 what you guys are saying about like, oh, you know, hand-painted isn't a style and everything. Um, I've always been quite interested actually in how you can marry a more a softer like overwatch style um with a sort of more cinematic realistic style like ways to marry these two things together to make something that's uh, sort of feels like that that triple a re uh, realistic cinematic experience but it, you know it's quite obviously um exaggerated in, in form and shape and like with very basic materials so what i wanted to ask is like how what are some ways that you think that um, we can push uh, that kind of uh, Overwatch style or something more, a little bit more of Warcraft um, into this sort of more realistic um, AAA kind of game without sort of losing that uh, that thing that makes it uh, that style? You know, like what 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 would you say are some of the key elements? Because for me, um, one of the things I've tried is a very like soft and large bevels. And really like low noise textures, but with really realistic lighting. And I think like that's one like it came up with some images that were quite interesting. I thought that that could be a really good way for people to push a style going forward. So what would you say some of the the ways that you can do that? Uh, yeah, I think I, like with the whole lighting, um, you can do now and probably also in the future so many new things or things will be so easier so much easier than than they were before and um trying to like combine that with with stylized art i think that might be a big push forward but it's also like in the the types of games i think because most like most very popular huge triple i games are realistic and um like those really heavy story driven games i don't think there are so many uh, that are actually stylized if I think about the last few years, I'm not pretty sure. I think, I don't know, it depends on the definition of AAA. I found Ori and Will of the Wisps to be, like, extremely story-driven and yeah. fucking mm. amazing, like, 10 out of 10 material. It's but, a really good game in general. <laughs> but it, I don't, it just didn't get the, the recognition, I guess, mm -hmm. as much as, like, again, Last of Us 2 is just everywhere and games that are stylized just don't seem to get as much... Like, yeah, that that's why I've always been interested in in, in that kind of marrying of those two sort of um, styles because it's like the stylized games don't tend to quite get that that recognition unless it's a uh, a Blizzard game, right? And I think maybe there's ways that we can do um, our own art, or you know, uh, say you're working on a you started a game and um, like I'm trying to find a way to stylize something uh, but also feel like a, like a Last of Us, right? Um, yeah, that that's kind of why I was asking that question, really. Yeah, but then on the other hand, I th like um, League of Legends, Overwatch, Fortnite, they're all so super True. successful. Um, like people play it, so I don't see why they wouldn't do that in a like kind of Last of Us style, uh, stylized way. I don't know why it's not being done. 
fingers crossed they do soon. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> I think a good example for that is during the PlayStation 5 um, reveal, there was this game called Kena. Oh, yeah. And oh, I love it. It I looks so good. It really does. And that was really impressive to me because I think they merged the, st- the stylization and the realism really well. And that almost reminded me of a Pixar movie. Yeah, and it looked Pixar like a movie. Mo- yeah, it really is. And I'd love to see that more in games, actually, to marry that um really <coughs> realistic feel to the lighting and the materials but with exaggerated and interesting shapes and designs that you can't see in reality and that was a great example to me for that and seeing the uh, actual reaction to that and how people are really excited about that shows that there is a demand for this actually and that yeah. studios should um, pursue that as well besides realism you know, I can't think of one example of a, a game that's a little bit more story driven. That's like that. That's a Ratchet and Clank, actually. Yes. Uh, it's very DreamWorks esque, but you know, it's a very single, big single player experience. I don't know if it is. A, I mean, is it really story driven? Like, I mean, it's a single player game, but it's, I wouldn't say it's story driven. It's a campaign, as... right? It's not like it's just uh, you get uh, you have a, a battle stage and you go in and you just have to fight, right? Sure. Sure. Yeah, I, I guess so. I guess you could you could argue that. Um, I think all these topics kind of lead into to the second uh, category Tim wanted to talk about, and that was like settling on a style. And I think Jasmine summed it up well. Like there is demand for games that like Kenna, where they blend Pixar and and this nice uh, stylization with realistic lighting. Um, like, what are some of the ways you can actually settle on a style? I guess would be the the question. Like working from big to to small i think you both have done it in your personal work as well and and that work but for people that are trying to get into stylized artwork and building a a recipe to follow like do you have any advice or um things you've done for your own personal artwork that you could offer um so on the on the settling on a style question i i i I hope i'll never settle on a style because i (laughs) Probably so much that I was still wanting to explore. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. It, advice. I don't know. Like advice for just stylized art in general, or like environment art. Well, I mean, because you're working on on Fortnite at the moment, and I imagine there's specific rules that are in place from art direction. Like this asset, you need to ensure it kind of fits within these um, this sort of recipe for it to fit within the universe. And I feel like a lot of that stuff is just overlooked by uh, juniors and, and graduate artists where they just create something and, and label it as, as stylized, but there's no real like steps that can be reproduced for every asset. I think you need to, like when you start out, like, of course you need to do all the, like you need to learn how to model and light and all that stuff, but you also need to train like your eye, especially when you look, if you, if you want to make fan art of something and just try to understand what, like what kind of is the art style because I see a lot of like fan art of things that don't really like they kind of get it right but not really because they're not really looking or understanding uh, what the art style is so how to get better at that I don't know I think it comes with time but it's always good to think about yeah I think a big part of that is analyzing your references especially if you want to model something in, in a stylized version let's put down quotations and you want to search for reference I think it, you can't create something stylized without knowing what the real thing actually looks like because and after understanding the object you want to create you then can start removing and adding details from that for example, you can exaggerate the shape at first when you understand why the shape is like that in the first place. And um, removing detail and simplifying those shapes requires that good understanding of the original object, I think. And that's what a lot of people might forget. It's like the same example in 2D that you can't draw something without having actual reference and people shouldn't be scared to look at their reference with like a very specific eye and not just be like, okay, I want to do something in an Overwatch style, so I'm just going to try it. So, yeah, use use reference for everything. Yes, <laughs> I, I, like I don't know. I, I, I had to make a chair in three D, and I put a chair on my second screen because I didn't know how a chair looked like anymore. Yes, or like it, like yeah, I think this looks like a chair, but I'll better check. So just just do it. Doesn't no one the, no one cares? Exactly. <laughs> but the, the thing is, though, so many people like I've done it myself as well, where I'll make I have a task to make something, and I'm like, I know exactly what that looks like. 
I'll just get started. But there's so much information you miss out on from just looking at a reference, like the chair, for example, there might be wood grain or scratches there in certain places that you just can't remember off the top of your head. So yeah, I, I think references, you just have to add it on your pure ref board, really. Like yeah, and I think people take step. references to literally anyway, right? Like uh, someone might look at a reference and be like, I'm going to make this exact thing. But it's really kind of just an inspiration to make something or a reminder of like how the chair is built or what does a, what does wood look like on a chair rather than yeah. I'm going to make this chair. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, I don't know that. I need to look that up. <laughs> <laughs> I think something that's uh, really cool that I've been doing recently on Pinterest, I've been looking at dollhouses and toys, how they um, maybe exaggerate shapes of specific objects. And um, that's maybe a good reference point too, I think. Because they manage to capture the details of something very nicely, and you can recognize it instantly, even though there's not much detail to the actual toy itself. Interesting. Everyone's finding unique places to find reference. I know Hannah and Mary were using eBay. <laughs> <laughs> one, yeah, one, of, one of the best advice that was eBay. Was <laughs> so I heard they, that episode. Were, it was great. I mean, it's it makes it sounds ridiculous when you first hear. You're like, what? <laughs> but like, it makes so much sense because people are people. Are, taking as many pictures as they can to get rid of the damn item so <laughs> but yeah okay dollhouses is a i've never heard that one before <laughs> just go into that's, your the first, that's the first <laughs> yep. i think for <laughs> like for environment art what i always find really really helpful is like look at uh, like theme parks how they like yes yeah, like true. build their their places and stuff because it's always like really good stuff and they they know exactly what they're doing and i look at that a lot that's a good idea you should definitely watch the documentary on Disney Plus called Imagineering, because they. I don't they... have Disney Plus, but I can <laughs> I can pur- I can purchase it right now on this podcast. <laughs> it almost sounds like a product placement, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> Jasmine's working for Disney. Confirm. <laughs> I wish, <laughs> but no, it's really great for environment art, I think, and game development because they explain how each ride has an intention behind and how they start designing it, and they have all these uh, small models created of it, and even use Unreal Engine for it sometimes, and it's really amazing. I think it's a great reference point for environment art too. Yeah, that's actually a, a really good one. Um, just thinking about it now, actually, because all rides have to be like made to look interesting and yep. fit within the film and excited kids and adults as well so yeah that's actually a, a really good idea yeah or even like how they film. how they try to like move people through the park like you don't know yep. what's happening but you are being influenced by all these things and then the flow of people just like is, is so much better when they do all their like planning and intentional storytelling and like even the if you, if you wait for for the next ride, there's always like they guide you in a way, and they, they start telling the story to, uh, when you step the foot in the in the line. Yeah. yeah, it's not a boring line with just gray barriers. It's in a good theme park, I mean, there's probably places <laughs> <laughs> not yeah. that great. But... but I mean, Disney theme parks are generally good, at least the ones I've been to. So yeah, <laughs> I can't complain. Yeah, that that notion of uh, being intentional in how we work seems like something that's pretty key to producing stylized or, or kind of working on your style and trying to make work that feels um, kind of authentic, even though it's it's maybe not following um, realistic rules. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when you're kind of, uh, I'm going to direct this one at, at Jasmine, but you, you were mentioning about kind of making your own art Bible earlier and uh, with your um, the King Arthur Art Station Challenge, where you made those three props, mm-hmm. um, how did you kind of manage to keep all of them uh, within a consistent style that was your own, whilst also kind of moving away from uh, just copying directly the references that you were using? Um, that's a tough one, because the way I work is very organic in a way, especially in that challenge, I kept swapping between the three props constantly to probably yeah, ensure that they all look similar and um, look like they belong together, actually. So that was really important to not get a tunnel vision on one prop and just finish that till the end and be like, okay, I need to now make them all fit to this style already. Um, I think from the start, I wanted to have everything, as you said, have an intention. Everything, every cut that I have in the asset or every broken part has to tell a story and has to have a meaning behind it. I think that makes the biggest difference. And um, 
that's something and most of my references as well weren't just the concept that's a good point you don't want to copy exactly what's in the concept but what the concept artist did which was amazing he put actual references from real life objects that he used as um, reference points for creating the concept so I went back into them and then created my own mood board based on those and started referencing them into my texture work so I wasn't looking at the concept anymore so much and just trying to replicate the real life crystal into my crystal and seeing which details I can add and remove from it which is again like we said earlier where you try to see um, what what do I want to use from this reference and what can I leave out that's not gonna overdo the detailing but yeah, it's like an organic process. It's hard to describe sometimes because, I, as I said, I would just go back and forth a lot of times until I would feel like, okay, they look like they belong to one set. Yeah, but I mean, that's normally how games are made anyway, though. Like you block out most of the, well, a few parts of the world and, and kind of build them up at the same time. Yeah. Um, I think it'd be pretty crazy to to finish one part of the game and like, all right, it's finished. Let's <laughs> let's go back to let's go back to yeah, level zero and, and fix it up again. Yeah, <laughs> like this tree in the scene looks amazing around these gray blocks. <laughs> <laughs> That's the vertical slice right there. The right. Vertical slice is just the tree, <laughs> <laughs> just just a single tree. Yeah, it's hard to but, judge um, anything if it's not all on the same kind of level. So it's good to like go back and forth and stuff. I guess. Yeah. So I guess on the flip side of that, um, Tobias, you've got some some quite big uh, environments as well as a couple of kind of dioramas uh, on your right station. How do you kind of keep a consistent style um, within each of those? So kind of when you're approaching uh, one of your environments, how are you going to making sure? Is it a similar kind of process? Have you got other other approaches to that? Mm, no, it's, it's, I, it's pretty similar, I would say. Like I would start by just like literally having... Uh, blocks in the environment like big squares like where's where uh, my shape's gonna be and then just like work my way to smaller steps smaller details and then start texturing and then i usually would like make a few smart materials that kind of work um can just put that on everything uh see how that looks in the scene uh start lighting it early so i know what kind of my mood is going to be and then i think it takes a long time till i have actually something that is a finished asset that I will not touch anymore in the scene. It's pretty much towards the end. So do you know when, I guess this is for both of you, but like when you're making these these scenes and, and assets, do you know when you've made a prop that fits? Like, okay, this one is done. This is the this is the benchmark that I want the rest to, to live up to. Or do you just kind of continue progressing until you, you feel comfortable or this is this is okay? Or do you, do you have that goal in mind? Uh, is, just is what I'm asking. Once I force myself to stop, I guess, because you can always do something about it. Yeah, oh, you can go on forever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now I relate to that a lot because in my last environment, I've made a lot of props from the start. And then over time, when I was learning new things and new techniques, I would adjust all my props to those new benchmarks I would set for myself. Uh, so I think it's oh, hard. Yeah, that's <laughs> kind of, it was a bit much, <laughs> but I think it was okay because I was learning designer and painter at the same time while making the project. So towards the end, I wanted to make everything fit together, especially when you look at the scene, you see something is standing out too much, not in a positive way. Then I feel like I need to change that and make it fit like, harmon like in a harmonic way to everything else too, especially in the scene. So, um, but yeah, as Tobias said, you got to stop yourself at some point because otherwise you'll be there till the next century. <laughs> I think that's the hardest part. Like my, my current project, I mean, Jasmine, you've seen it, the kitchen, like yeah. it's just, I, I can't see the end. I don't know when to stop. Like it's, it's, I think that's the hardest part that most, most artists, um, yeah, an artist's work is never done, right? Stopping. Yeah. Classic saying. yeah, that's a good part. That's one. Well, that is a good part of having a deadline someone just tells you hey this needs to be done and you just yeah. do, do your best until that point and then be done with it yeah it's pretty nice but, to have a deadline sometimes yeah but if you set that deadline yourself you can change it so oh yeah and i do yeah. i do change it so, <laughs> like, <laughs> I so need someone no else real... to tell me <laughs> i gotta find someone to give me a deadline that's what i need i guess that's what art station challenges are, are something that's really good for then yeah. Um, I think you've, you've both kind of participated in a few different challenges, right? Um, mm -hmm. 
is that something that helped you to kind of have that deadline and um, a goal, a set goal of, well, I've only got the two months. This is kind of, I've got to have it done by then. Yeah, that definitely helps. I think for me at the moment as well, I want things in my portfolio for when I graduate next year. So I have that big deadline in mind. And then I try to set for myself in a year, I want to have at least maybe three personal projects and then I'll try to reach that goal for myself as well. But having somebody telling you there's a deadline really helps too. That's why I usually show my work to my friends and even family or my partner. And they usually tell me like, right, Jasmine, just stop now. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, oh, my, I don't, my friends, my family don't do that. They just say, look, that's, that's it. Like, they don't give me any, <laughs> any harsh feedback. My looks great. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, no one doesn't count. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's, it doesn't but like, work. <laughs> But friend, my friends are usually pretty straightforward who also do 3D. So that's good. That's, good. that's uh, really nice to have somebody who doesn't sugarcoat anything and just says, okay, this needs improving. No, this this doesn't anymore, especially after you've been working on something for three months or something. Then it should reach a point where you're like, okay, I need to wrap it up. <laughs> so you've both you've both participated in the Art Station Challenge. Um, and... I wanted to ask if if people are or people listening like if if they had to choose between obviously a personal project that they may be halfway through and then the the art station challenge it gets announced do you think it's worthwhile for people to to pause their personal project and and like participate in the challenge because there is a deadline and there's you know there's that healthy competition happening online um I don't know if that's what you two did or if 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 that's what you would kind of recommend to people um, so I I, like, I, for me personally, like the last few art station challenges I joined, I never finished. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I guess it's like what everyone wants out of the challenge. Like what I what I want out of the challenge is uh, for me, it's a good opportunity to see really awesome concept art to sometimes topics that really interest me, and that's like why I made a few pieces, but not not recently anymore because also like what I want to get out of it is a nice art piece that's it i don't want to win or i don't want to like i don't know mm. compete or anything it's just nice having so many people work on something see all their interpretation of it um so i just do the part that i like and then i like i mean i just recently posted this uh this axe from the art station challenge that's like over a year I ago see. um <laughs> <laughs> looks really great so, it looks good. It yeah looks thanks really but good. it's like yeah I, I really liked it and i had the sculpt um, lying around but i just never had the time and right now i'm not I'm not doing that much um, personal art anyway, so I kind of don't want the extra added stress to like post a to post, post a link submission. They might <laughs> they might allow it. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> a year later, <laughs> like I, Sorry, I, guys, I, I lost, lost track of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm here now though, so it's like... <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know, like. Um, just if, but yeah, if like I, I can see for people like if they, they should maybe try it out. Like even if you're starting out, uh, try and see because it's good to like, um, if, especially if you're beginning, you can compare yourself to like what other people are doing and see where you're at. Yeah, definitely, I agree. Because when I did it last year, I was doing my uh, university term and I actually had a lot of deadlines, but I did it anyway because I just thought I'd give it a go. And I never did it before, and I just want to know what it's like taking part in a challenge and it's really fun because having other people at the same time doing even the same props as you at the same environment concepts it's really inspiring to see how other people approach things and get some inspiration from that or even learn new things and get feedback from people and I would recommend it to anyone really so I think it's worth putting like your personal project on hold for one month and just try and see what comes out of this challenge okay cool good to know and well you won the <laughs> challenge and tobias came third so you're both winners um i just wanted to ask like has that has that had a impact on your like professional career have you landed uh jobs because of it or interviews and things like that like how has that how has that benefited your progression it 
did personally help me a lot. I did get contacted by some studios and had interviews, but the problem with me right now is I can't really accept any offers, so I just have to tell them to wait a bit. <laughs> Everyone wants job offers and you've got them all on the table. Sorry, sorry. But if it's still there the in a year, <laughs> that's the question. <laughs> But um, it, it's definitely worth it because it gets those extra eyes on your work and um, having some networking, especially during your time at university, is super important, I think, and having nice portfolio pieces and also an international award because I heard from some of my colleagues that were saying, oh, it's really good that you won the challenge because this might help you later on with the visa for getting abroad. Oh, really? I did not yeah. know that. Okay. Because yeah. it's an internationally um, acclaimed prize in a sense, so it counts as something which is great <laughs> okay so. cool good to know and and uh tobias i mean yours was four years ago so like how how did that impact your your career progression moving to, to spyro and then fortnite um i think it was a good time for doing that piece because it's uh kind of fell in line with like the style i was doing at the time and also like environment art and um, definitely, like, there's still people like telling me sometimes, "Hey, I found you on Art Station, and I really like your uh, Art Station challenge submission." I'm like, oh, really? That's old, but cool. <laughs> so it's, it's definitely a good thing to have done it. And I wish I've done, I did more, but that's the only one that I ever finished. I think. <clears throat> I mean, you could always go back and just continue. You know, do a do a remaster. <laughs> yeah, but I think we all have uh, projects like sitting around on the hard drive. Touch them again. Yeah, I, an art graveyard. I think everyone has that. I have a huge that shelf famous. at home full of hard drives. <laughs> it's a it's a shame you can't land a job with just like how beefy your art graveyard is. To be honest, because <laughs> yeah. that would be great. I feel like a weirdo, but I don't really have one. Really? Oh wow! You finish, you, you finish everything. Like you, you finish all of, your projects. I kind of do. It's weird. I know it's not very really, um, like relatable or anything. And it's I crazy. You're the first person who's ever said that. Maybe that's the. Maybe that is the secret. That's to the key. All the job offers on the table. Like finish, <laughs> finish your projects, people. Just finish them. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't sit right with me when I don't finish something. I feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> and I never like heard anyone share this sentiment. So I don't but know. But you never, you never work and look at it and like, what am I doing? This I shouldn't be doing this. I need to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a lot of moments like that with every single project I did. <laughs> and, but you just uh, keep pushing through. Okay, yeah. I should try that more. I don't know if it's healthy though. That's the thing. Like. I might be burning myself out secretly every time. And <laughs> but. So speaking of burnout, actually, um, like how 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 much time did you spend on the, the marketplace, for example, or just scenes in general? Because you said you finish everything. So like, do you take breaks or do you just power through? I do take breaks. I um, actually sometimes um, like to take pretty long breaks. <laughs> so I just have days where I don't do anything really. I'll just do my uni work and so I'm kind of forced to take breaks from personal projects. Um, but I also realized that I don't work really well if I just constantly work 10 hours a day and um, I start to lose inspiration really fast that way as well. Yeah, it's tough. It's, it is difficult. And I remember, I think, I'm not sure if I heard it correctly, but Tobias, you said you, you haven't been working on personal projects lately, I guess, because work's busy, busy, but like, how do you, how do you stay motivated with, with personal artwork or do you just, um, is that something you come back to later on? So yeah, it kind of changed recently or like not recently, but like the last few years or something where like I started doing like a lot smaller things like doing like substance materials or just a prop or something because it's like, it's much more manageable to finish, to actually finish something. Because uh, I don't, yeah. If I do like a, a big project, then it's probably it's more more unlikely that I will finish it. And I'm just like I'm more looking for kind of new ways to 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 learn new new stuff. And just because I can, I feel quite comfortable making like if I I can make another environment in my style, but maybe I should try something else. So I'm kind of exploring that. Okay, so there is one more thing uh, I wanted to kind of talk about. Previously, I can't remember who mentioned it. But we kind of talked about how um, there's a kind of common pitfall, especially a lot of beginners fall into where they'll kind of label their work as stylized um, or they'll use semi stylized uh, when in reality they've kind of just been trying to work on something and they haven't um, 
they haven't really achieved what they were trying to achieve with it. So they're kind of trying to pass it off as something that's perhaps, uh, you know, maybe something that, that it isn't really. Um, so kind of pitfalls like this, uh, without, I guess, being so specific that you're naming exact people's work, what kind of things do you see when you're you know, browsing through ArtStation or looking at kind of stylized work that you come across online, um, perhaps more kind of in, in line with hand painted or, or the kind of, um, looks that you guys uh, do yourselves or kind of common mistakes are you seeing out there um, that you think are kind of tripping up newer artists or beginners? It's a big one. Yeah. I think one main thing I see, especially with hand painted stuff is that people might over sculpt their base and then are too scared to change the base from that point on because it really fastens up your process if you have a zebra sculpt and then bake it down and then use that as your diffuse layer to paint on but sometimes you can really tell from a piece that it's been sculpted previously but it's missing the normal information all the other maps and it just feels not very bright in that style so i would say that if you want to go down that route and do hand painted and facilitate your process, definitely don't be scared to paint over your base and change details and add some lighting information. Don't rely too much on the sculpt you have because um, that can ruin the piece a lot, I think. Yeah, what I what I think I see a lot is, especially with stylist work, um, you can see, and we talked about this earlier, but you can see when people don't use reference. Um, because it's like what I see a lot in the environment, especially is that the scale is just wrong. That there's like a window that is like three pe persons high and then the door is super small or something. But um, <laughs> also like when people try to like to stylize like a like a building or like an interior of a temple or something, and then everything is just boxes and doesn't really follow the the shapes it's just anymore. Just stylized. Yeah, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's, you can see that, that people have not been been looking. Um, yeah, and there's so much. Like you have the whole internet in front of you, you can just look at anything you want. If you're not sure, just look it up. Yeah. And I think you can also tell when somebody just references games and other people's work instead of looking at maybe real life rest references, because that makes the biggest difference, in my opinion, to just try to replicate somebody else's artwork and the way they stylize something into your own. Because it can really help to see how other people do, but just trying to replicate that to make your own thing stylized doesn't really work out, I think, most of the time. I think that comes back to what Luan was saying, though, where people, like, they'll have a reference and copy it one-to-one. -one. So if they have a, if someone looks for a chair, for example, uh, Tobias gave them a task, and they find a realistic chair, I imagine they'll make it look exactly like that, and then they might struggle with adding a style. So it, it seems like a... a a difficult thing for many artists working in a, a stylized field. The same sentiment, but like even like someone that follows a tutorial, but just follows the tutorial to the T and says, "Here, I've done it," rather than actually, you know, take that information and do something with it. But um, I find that happens a lot as well. Yeah, I see it quite a bit. Yeah, definitely. And I don't think that's very appealing to employers either, especially if you're following a tutorial and just replicate that one to one and put that as a portfolio piece in your. In your yeah, website. I don't know. I think it's 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 okay to do, but it shouldn't be your only or your best portfolio piece because if, if I yeah, if I look at someone, <laughs> <laughs> if I look at someone's art station and I see all these uh, tutorials I've seen before, it's it's a bit more like off putting than someone who did that and something with it, like something new. Yeah. So with that then, uh, what is something that someone who's kind of just getting into it or um, is looking to build a portfolio, what, what could they do if they want to go into kind of more um, heavily stylized work to actually stand out rather than just having um, you know, the same kind of tutorial based pieces or um, that kind of stuff that like you were saying, what, what, what can they do? Hmm. What helped me a lot was taking concepts that are already pretty stylized and uh, replicating them in 3D, but not one-to-one, -one, trying to improve on parts of the concept uh, while keeping the whole essence to it, because that's what something you have to do in a studio later on too. You will get a concept and you will have to remake that in 3D, but you can't just like follow each 
part of the concept one to one and try to copy that. So I think having that in your portfolio and showing that skill is very important. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, just try, and it's 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 really hard, but try come up with something original. Um, it's I think people are more interested in seeing something they haven't seen before, um, and also presenting it well is you can make great art and it doesn't look great because the lighting is not super yeah. great and and all that. So also spending time on that. Yeah, definitely. Especially on the font you choose to write your detail information, because I've seen very terrible <laughs> ones before, <laughs> and, it's, and they're like sometimes really huge on the piece, and most of the presentation sheet is just their email address and their name instead of having the artwork actually bigger on the presentation thing. It seems to be quite um, quite a recurring theme about uh, spending more time on that on that final presentation to kind of really. Um, get the you know, making your work look good um that does seem like a thing that is quite common especially amongst more inexperienced artists where they uh they kind of just want to push the work out the door um at the end rather than spending that extra kind of 10 percent to really really make it stand out it's that 10 percent that pushes the art 50 percent, right oh yeah yeah definitely 100%. and it takes yeah. the longest <laughs> it does, yeah <laughs> It's like an additional week or two on top of the whole process. <laughs> I think that's the best time to take a break when you're about to do like final lighting is just step away. At least yeah. for me, anyway, I think just step away, come back and you'll be fresh. All right, let's do this. Let's finish this and, and get it out then. Yeah, definitely. Because then you feel like you accomplished something already. So you feel like you deserve that break too. Which, But then again, you always deserve a break. That shouldn't mean... Yeah, I good. need a vacation. <laughs> I need a vacation right now. Yeah, you should do one. Well, no, okay, not right now, maybe. that's Not right now, but no. soon. <laughs> yeah, go next, right yeah, in a second. <laughs> I, I, I've got to jump out, everyone. I'm sorry, but I have to take a, a vacation. So. <laughs> but uh, no, there was actually something I wanted to ask both of you. Um, and it comes to applying for jobs obviously if, if someone's making a portfolio with lots of realistic assets they have a, a huge um, pool of, of companies that they could potentially go for but if if someone curates their portfolio for say a, a nintendo and they don't get that job unfortunately um do they still have um a chance at landing a job at say uh, blizzard or another stylized company such as square Enix? Um, how do they avoid like caging themselves into just one basket is, is probably how I would, um, what I'd like to ask. Um, so I think um, it is, I've, I've done that too, but I think it's, it's dangerous if you really have this one game or this one company you want to work for and tailor your entire portfolio to that because the chances are that it's not going to work out. And then um, like if I, if I would apply like to a more realistic studio, I would have like really bad cards, I think. But um, so, in the beginning, it's probably better to go broad, um, even with like stylized work. And of course, if you're really passionate about something, you can, you can always like aim uh, to a specific place. But it's 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 dangerous. Yeah. So if if you were if you were starting your career again, or you were talking to younger Tobias, <laughs> for example, like like you said, go really broad. So what what does that actually in, entail? Like what? When you say go really broad, do you mean make environments, props in in a multitude of different styles, or do you mean just maybe pick three or four and, and try to ensure that they they tick a few boxes for for different companies? I think um, I mean I, I was pretty sure at the beginning I wanted to do stylized, I just didn't know what or like what what that is, and I find that out more and more now. But um, mm -hmm. just I mean in the beginning, just try things out. You will like I did so many things that I thought I would like and I didn't. Um, and that helped me really in the beginning. And I think in the beginning, it's it's more important to get a job and work, and to just know what like all the processes are and what it actually means to work on the game, um, than already like going for whatever you want or what you think you want. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Because when I started out, I felt a bit pressured to focus on one specific art style for a company and then just do that really well. But I never felt really comfortable doing that. And I still don't because I really enjoy exploring different styles and letting my creativity 
flow in a sense now while I'm still able to do that. And uh, talking to other people from studios, they said that's actually really nice to see in some ways portfolio that they have a common theme in their work, that they have something they really enjoy doing, but they still explore different uh, avenues within that without getting like completely into the opposite field, like realism or something like within stylized, still showing that you have a variety in your work and that you can adapt to a style. Because uh, during my internship, I worked on a project that looks completely different to what I usually work on, but I was still very comfortable doing so. And they were confident I could also pull that off as well because I have a, a sense of variety in my work as well. So I think that's really important to show in your portfolio too. Yeah, that, I think that's that, uh, worrying. Uh, uh, go on, go on to my no, I think I just wanted to add that it happens a lot that things change. So yeah, suddenly you work on a completely different game with a completely different style, and it's just you need to kind of say, "Yeah, okay, I can do this," or kind of leave. So <laughs> <laughs> just walk out the door. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> but... Or being uh, made to leave or whatever. But uh, yeah, so it's need to like. Personal work and, and, and work at uh, the studios is a different thing and you need to adapt yeah. more in like in development. I feel like I feel like you would learn a lot more working on a, a new style, for example. Like like Jasmine, you said you you were, it was a completely different style to your portfolio and maybe you've both experienced this. But I imagine you learn new things like, oh shit, like we can do it that way. Like I can do that with my personal work now and, and try yeah. that technique with with my artwork and and before you know you're like you've you've just solved a, a new formula yeah definitely actually that, being there and doing something that's not really in my comfort zone inspired me to then do my next project in pbr and um, try something completely different um because i saw that it is possible to go outside of my comfort zone really far and learn something new out of it and feel very um accomplished at the end of it too so uh, it's, I think, especially at the start, when you're getting into 3D and art, you shouldn't pigeonhole yourself into one star. I think it can limit your abilities a lot in a sense. Right. So we're, we're heading up to about an hour now. Um, so I'm going to just transition this over to a couple of questions from our Patreon supporters for you guys. Um, and then we will kind of end off there. So we have two questions. Um, so the first question from Alexander. Uh, he asks, with photogrammetry having such an impact on realistic art, how does it affect the stylized side of things? Is there something having a similar effect on stylized art that doesn't affect real realistic art in the same way? So I guess that's kind of um, looking at the technological advancements um, with Photoscan, Megascan, um, even like the Unreal Engine 5 stuff. Um, how do you think that kind of technology is going to affect stylized art um, over realistic art? Jesus Christ! <laughs> I need a I need to have a drink. One sec. <laughs> um, okay, I can I can try maybe answer some of this. <laughs> <It's pretty hard. laughs> um, so about the photogrammetry part, um, it's great. I I really like to see it, and it's like pushing like photorealism even further, and it's going to be even more and more possible. So I'm excited for that. I don't think it's going to influence stylization because you cannot take a picture of something that hasn't been made yet or isn't like rooted in, in the real world um, but I think even with stylized art, um, like some games they just try to be like have their materials and lighting as realistic as possible and getting that a lot easier and faster for the artist and just having everything kind of just work uh, I think that's really exciting for any, any art style I yeah, think one of the main things that uh, mega scans and stuff could help with uh, stylized art is, I know they have a, a whole se section of their website like dedicated to like, uh, oh look, well, you can use Mixer to make stylized stuff as well. But it's just getting like accurate um, albedo values for certain materials. So like mm. that kind of stuff is probably going to help uh, like your materials a fair bit, even if it's just a flat value, it's still like a fairly accurate luminance value, right? Um, I, I guess that's one way that it could help. 
Yeah, that's a good point. I personally think also it's great to have uh, all these um, models as a reference as well, because I already go on Sketchfab now and look at people's photogrammetry models and where they scan a full town or a house. And it's much different to see these things in a 3D space and gather reference through that than going on Google Images and seeing it as a 2D image. So I think um, for the whole creation process, process, it will help a lot as well. All right, and we have uh, one more question here from Angelo, uh, who's asked, with realism, we can usually pinpoint what is missing um, or what kind of makes it feel like it's uncanny valley. But with stylized art, that's a little bit muddier. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how to make more believable worlds in a stylized art style? Man, why can't they just ask simple <laughs> questions like, how do you do this? What's your favorite color? <laughs> 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 like a full topic in itself <laughs> yeah all right we'll have to do another hour guys but uh, we'll take a quick <laughs> recess quick intermission can you can you ask again i need to hear this again <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically um the tdlr i guess for it is uh with realism you kind of have like the uncanny valley uh it, it can be a bit easier for people to to pick up on when something looks off um with stylized art that can uh, that can be a bit more tricky to gauge, but 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 there is still kind of that element of uncanny value there. So how, when working in kind of stylized world, worlds, how do you make them more believable and avoid that kind of weird um, Polar Express type? I guess it comes to the... <laughs> I, guess, I guess that's I guess. The, the consistency yes. that they were mentioning yeah. earlier, um, right? Definitely, yes having a consistent art style, having a consistent logic within the whole world you're playing the game and that suddenly one object has more details than the other or has a weird function to it. Like you can't just um, have stuff making less sense just because it's stylized. Like it still has to have some sort of um, logic to it, I think. And that's what a lot of people might forget when doing stylized things, just saying, oh no, it's stylized, but that doesn't mean you can just throw all these things out of the window suddenly. Yeah, I think uh, like our job basically is uh, how do we make stuff believable, and so that's a good question. Like I don't even know that myself. How it, like how do we convince people that what we make is just believe it and, and believable in the game? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just but, a gun to their head. I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like um, because everything that we know and see every day is kind of based on rules, so we kind of know how things behave in the real world, and we kind of expect that. To be the same and like even in virtual worlds so like lighting for example should react kind of the same as we know it um and materials should especially now with pbr they should react and look the same way as we we know it from like looking at stuff uh, that's not in front of our screen so just trying to keep some of the rules um and then just adding the style on top of it The lighting is actually quite a, a big one. I know Ken mentioned um, Ori and the World of the Wisps earlier, but when I played through that, what really blew me away is how they used a really um, kind of realistic lighting system in a really stylized, uh, was cartoony world. And it, that kind of, um, the way they merged those was really, really impressive. And it really added an extra layer to the visuals and kind of believability that this was a kind of fantasy world. Yeah, that's a really good example. It's also in, I don't know if you guys know the game Journey, where you're in the, forest, in the, uh, yeah. the desert most of the time, and the whole atmosphere of the desert feels very realistic in a sense to me too, even though the textures are very flat and simple and the characters and there's not much poly detail to anything, but the whole mood and the atmosphere really makes you feel like you're also in the desert at that time when you're playing the game. I think some of that goes down to like, go back to uh, knowing what something looks like, right? The whole reference thing we were talking about is like yeah. understanding what makes a desert a desert. And yeah. <laughs> that's just going to help, right? Even if you're using flat colors, it's really going to help sell your desert. Yeah. Exactly. Because yeah, everyone's going to associate I'm... something with it. Yeah, I think we're like uh, always very good at picking up things that are not right. And then if, if you see something like that, it's all you can focus on so jobs kind of to avoid making that happen 
Yeah, people might not be able to um, draw out something. Like if you if you ask someone to draw a horse, that horse is probably going to look pretty terrible without reference. But if uh, if you show them a picture of a horse and something's not right, they'll be able to tell you what's wrong with the horse, even if they couldn't draw that from memory. Yeah. Um, all right, brilliant. So I think that's about a good time to wrap up. So. Oh, I think Luan, I think are you gonna you're gonna jump in with Luan's special bonus question? We <laughs> <Luan's> little jingle, <laughs> <laughs> develop yeah, yeah. Can, can a jingle for it. Can you actually figure out a little jingle for next time? <laughs> <laughs> I'll insert uh, that in. <laughs> uh, so I usually throw in a, like a random question at the end. Uh, usually it's like particularly unrelated, but some um, I actually wanted to know this before we even started, and uh, even um, Crack has said to ask this. Um, what made you choose stylized art over realistic art? Like, was there like a you were watching, I don't know, How to Train Your Dragon, and you went, oh, that's it, I want to make that. Like, <laughs> was there something? Like, what made you choose? For me, I think it's been in the process since I'm a child, because all the games I played as a kid were stylized. I didn't play any games that were realistic in any way. I know that games from 10 years ago didn't look very realistic, but they obviously been trying for a long they time. They did back then, I guess. They yeah. did at the time, I guess. but Yeah, that's in the 90s as well. Um, no, probably not. I'll give you that one. <laughs> the PS1. <laughs> they were playing like right. Medal of Honor on the PS1 and going, "Wow, look at this, Dad! Look at these graphics." That's true. Like Silent Hill was pretty creepy. Yeah. As well. <laughs> but yeah, any game I played as a kid was very stylized, like Animal Crossing, Sims, and I've always wondered how you can do these things. And once I got to an age where I would understand, okay, there's more behind this than magic. Um, I started to get into it more and I never felt the urge to go into realism at all. I was always very impressed by it, but I never thought, oh, I want to do this now because it's much more interesting to me to bring my creativity into it as well and my imagination and exaggerating reality. And I think that's what I can do in stylized art a lot more. I, I'm, I'm pretty much the same. Uh, it's just, I, I mean, I, I've worked on realistic stuff too and if i compare it i like i like working on stylized things more personally and uh also like the the kind of games you play and media you consume and just i'm still not tired of it so um probably just keep doing that i think stylized games really age well sometimes too compared to Definitely. realistic ones so when you get back to them now, I'm still pretty much impressed by their color choices or how they concepted specific things. And I think that's very impressive. And I hope that my work can age well in that sense too. It's a great benchmark to reach, I think. Yeah, you Sorry, can go back bro. and play like a Final Fantasy IX like, uh, like Cam is doing right now. And it's just like, wow, the, like a lot, lot of aspects of the game holds up. Maybe like not so much the resolution or anything, but mm -hmm. what the decisions hey, made really good. Yeah. Dude, all the PS1 games look good. I have no idea what you lot are talking about right now. But... <laughs> they do, actually. People on itch.io all those, replicate all those polygon faces. You know, Lara Croft from PS1 <laughs> looks better. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, it, I, um, I, I played during the, the whole pandemic thing. In the beginning, I played a bit of like the classic WoW thing. Um, and I was kind of surprised sometimes at how good it looked for something that is... 15 years old now or 10 i don't know but um still like, like 15 isn't it yeah i think it's yeah. around that so it's pretty pretty old and it's still kind of you, you can see its age but it's still holding up like maybe not so much more in the five to ten years but it's still like quite impressive what an art style can do yeah definitely it's the same when you watch disney movies or any animated movies that are not like super recent that 2d usually as well they age pretty well i think compared to 3d movies shrek yeah. will always hold up <laughs> <laughs> shrek is life for shrek different reasons <laughs> yeah. genre for itself <laughs> yeah the, the 2d kind of old old school disney movies the uh, guys working on that really work and the masters of their art like sleeping beauty still looks pretty damn good even though it's what over 20 years old yeah much older than that. I think yeah. it's a lot older. Yeah, much, much older. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, it's, that was the, no, it's, that it's, was the first. I'm, I'm technically correct. It is more than 20. <laughs> Even though it's what over. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. 20 years ago is like 2000. Yeah. yeah. yeah mate. Yes, it is. 
We're still, yeah. in, we're still in 2001. I remember it. <laughs> Tim's <laughs> just realised we're yeah. in 2020, everyone. So You're in 2020. Please. I'm still in a McDonald's at the Millennium Dome in 2000. <laughs> please, so. please bear with him. There might be a delay in the next episode, but it's we're a, back on his feet. Re- <laughs> really long stream lag. <laughs> <laughs> Traveling background now. Oh, that, <laughs> have a good journey. that walking with dinosaurs was pretty good, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. So, thank you to uh, Kem and Luan for helping me host, and a big thank you to Jasmine and Tobias for joining us to talk about uh, stylized art. Uh, if you want to know more about EXP, head on over to the Experience Points website. Uh, check out the discord or follow us on twitter all the links will be in the description below Uh, thanks for joining us and take care